to put insurance on this page six times, please interrupt me with questions. Um, that's the best way to learn about this. Um, we're going to be going over some generals of how these work, but most importantly, because these are your employee benefit packages, we're going to learn the questions that you need to be asking HR so that you have the pertinent information to be able to make decisions for your family um, on health insurance, most importantly, some retirement planning, dental and vision insurance, short-term and long-term disability. There's going to be a little bit of what's the difference there, and then life insurance insurance and ADD, which is accidental death and dismemberment. So these are what you typically are offered in some fashion. It may be one of these. It may be the whole cafeteria plan. It may be that you have a couple of options, but this is going to give you the roots on to how do I make these decisions and how do I use these? So before I get into that, who am I? I am a certified financial planner that works with Richard Zakharoff and Associates. We're an independent firm, which means that we work with over a hundred insurance companies. Uh, so it's not that we're getting information from just one company, but we pull them from whatever company is helping our clients at the time. I have 10 years experience doing this. And what I do specifically day in and day out is help small businesses actually implement all of these plans. We go through these what is the best for our employees? How does this work for our employees? And how do we get it to them every day? So these types of conversations are what I have with the employers and employees to help them understand what they're doing every day. Uh, so the dreaded health insurance. Uh, we all like to say, I have it, and it doesn't work, and it's not very good, and I don't understand it. Um, so First and foremost, you have a new plan or a new couple of plan options. How do you pick the best plan? What does that look like? Um, first and foremost, the question that you need to be looking for is if your employer is going to be offering you more than one plan, make sure that the network is with your current providers. You can either get a list off of your current provider's website of insurance companies that they accept and the network specifically that they accept, or you can just call them. I do this all the time. I call up Dr. Smith and I say, hey, Dr. Smith, do you take Cigna PPO? Do you take this? Do you take that? And typically they can answer those really quickly for you. But doing that little step of research is going to make your transition into a new plan that much more seamless because before you look at price before you look at anything make sure that the doctors that you need not the doctors that you want but the doctors that you need are in your plan and the way that i kind of uh define what is need versus want is my OBGYN saved my life twice i need her i kind of like my pcp she's good I can ask her a question, but if I had to change, would it break my heart? And that's really the difference that I look at in the need versus want uh, scenario. Um, second, if you don't understand an abbreviation from something that your HR has given you, ask what it is. We're going to go through a few of those. I have an example of what the health plan uh, can look like here on the next slide. But if you don't know what an abbreviation means, ask. Don't just assume it's something because sometimes employers will change those. Sometimes insurance companies use different ones. Um, it's very big. Next, what does my employer cover? What, what does that look like? Is it, what's my monthly premium going to look like? Does the premium change if I add family members? All of that is kind of that third tier, right? Like I, I know my, my doctors take it. Now, how much is it going to cost me? And also asking if the employer has, if that is actually written in their handbook or if they have changed that policy in the last couple of years. Did they go from fully covering a plan to only covering maybe 70% of it in the last couple of years as adjustments have happened? You can see if that, you can actually have a little bit more of a level of expectation going forward with that. Now these benefits, we now understand them, we now what, know what they are, how do I best use them? The best trick of the trade that I have found is to make sure that with any plan, you go and register online. If you're using UHC, if you're using Oxford, if you're using 
um, Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield, they're all going to have extra information on those websites. And they are going to have sometimes even extra programs that if you do this online, whatever course, you get a hundred bucks or you get something free or they send you a trinket or they send you whatever it might be. But that's where you find those details and you can start to interact with the policy. Most people like to put their head in the sand and not actually do that part. And then they call me and they're like, I don't know where my card is. I don't know if this is covered. Online is a phenomenal resource that you just need to embrace and sign up for it as soon as you can. Um, now, open enrollment. Everybody hears this, but why is it so important? It's important for two reasons. At that point, you can change your plan. You are not stuck in your plan. If you have a plan that you hate for whatever reason at open enrollment, you can change that plan. You can also change who's on that plan. So say at that point, your husband or a husband now needs health insurance or has changed jobs and needs a better plan or your child is out of college but under 26 and still needs to go back on your health plan those are times when you can change your plan and that's important because there might be times when your health changes and you need increased benefit levels or different benefit levels or maybe your cash flow in your house has changed and you need to lower that premium this is the time that you can do that um, and being able to have that conversation with hr and say okay we need to change the plans. What are they? Are what are they right now? Is important. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I have a cold and I'm struggling with the coughing right now. Uh, and finally, what is Cobra? I don't know why is it so expensive. Cobra is your current plan. It's just no longer subsidized by your employer. So you get COBRA for 18 months um, after you leave a position, which is going to bridge that gap until you can find the next health insurance, right? Until you get that next job, till you qualify for the, uh, the waiting period on your next, um, your next set of benefits. That's what can bridge the gap. The nice thing is with COBRA that you do have a full 18 months. So if the other plan isn't as good or you have doctors that you know you're going to lose because you're going to change networks you you have control over when you quit cobra and you start up with a new plan um you have some control in there so use control use your cobra to be able to use the system in the way that it needs to be. So it's not, it does feel like it's expensive because it's the full premium that you would be paying if, um, or you are paying because the employer is no longer subsidizing. That is about the going rate for Obamacare uh, on the open market. So it would be the same as if you went to the open market and looked for health insurance. Um, so I, let me see, I have a couple in the chat. Um, I see uh, there was one question in the chat about this might be out of topic. I'm 67, single, never married with no children. What type of insurance should I have? That is Medicare. That is Medicare. Medicare is available as of 65. So that is where I would, I would definitely direct you on that side. Uh, are there any other questions before I get into how do I read a plan? Um, Medicare, you, you'll you probably be looking for the supplemental Medicare plans if you already have Medicare. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go into how I choose a plan and how I help people kind of look through the plans and make decisions. Maybe if my, ah, oh, there we go. So this is a very typical, I have a new job. I am being offered a health plan. These are the three plans that are being offered through my employer. Where do I go? Um, so at the very top, you can see plan type. One says platinum, one says silver, and one says bronze. 
And those are very important because that means that it is part of the standardized system that Obama put into place for the ACA, which is the Affordable Care Act. And what that's gonna say is that there are certain guarantees we know. We know that all of your preventative medicine will be covered at 100% before deductible, which means that you get to go for your annual checkup, your annual OBGYN checkup, and all cancer screenings, not diagnostic, but cancer screenings for free. Uh, and that is built into any of what we would def define as metaled plans, bronze, silver, gold, platinum. The bronze plans <coughs> are always going to be a deductible, a high deductible plan that does deductible first. Silver plans are kind of in the middle uh, where they're going to have some co-pays and some deductibles and those deductibles are gonna be kind of in that medium to high range. Gold plans are gonna have a significantly lower deductible with a copay and platinum typically have no deductible or very low deductibles and copays. So I'm gonna just define what that all means. Um, that silver plan in the middle is probably one of the most user-friendly plans that I see on a regular basis and one that's very helpful in understanding how this is going to work. So if you can see, and I'm this $30 deductible, oops, nope, $30, deduct, $30 deductible does not apply. That means for PCP office visits, if you are sick, if you have an infected toe, if you have pneumonia, something like that, and you need to go to the doctor, it's going to be 30 bucks. And that is going to be the end of it. There's not, you're not going to have to worry about the deductible. You're not going to have to worry about um, extra charges on top of that. Same thing happens with the next line. With the specialist, the copay is $80. Now, specialists are your cardiologist, they're your physical therapist, they're your pulmonologist, things like that. When you go do that visit, it's going to be $80. Now, something a lot of people ask, and it's good to always note, is does this plan require referrals? And at the very top of the second plan, or of the second column, you can see the plan type, and then it says referral, and then network, silver, it does require a referral. So that is something good to note that depending on plan, it will specify whether you need a referral or not. Um, especially when you use a lot of specialists, that's good to know whether you're gonna have to go to the primary care before you go to the specialist. Now, the one that's not listed on here that I often look at also is urgent care. Urgent care has become where insurance companies are trying to push you to go before the emergency room. If you don't have a bone sticking out, if you don't need stitches, then you probably are going to be told to go to urgent care first. Very honestly, you're going to have less wait times and you're probably going to have about the same amount of care uh, by going to urgent care. And often, if it shows that there is a copay where deductible does not apply, urgent care will be a specialist visit where deductible does not apply. And so again, it'll also be cheaper for you. So keep that in mind. Those are the, you know, I like to know where your copays are. And now what does a deductible? If you go two rows down from the $80 deductible, it says 3,500 slash 7,000. That's your deductible. 3,500 is your individual. So if just you are on the plan, your, in, your uh, deductible is going to be 3,500. If you have anyone else on the plan, it's going to be 7,000. And one of those things while you're taking notes to, um, to ask is whether or not that deductible is embedded or not. What that means is that if it is an embedded copay, once one person has hit 3,500, then you are going, then their insurance is going to kick in at whatever those percentage um, co-insurances will be. 
If it is not embedded, the family will have to hit 7,000 before anyone gets the coinsurance level. Um, it's one of those nuanced things that is confusing. And I usually repeat three or four times. So I'm happy to repeat it again if, if, if you want another example. But embedded means that the individual only has to hit the individual level before the rest of the insurance kicks in. If, the, <clears throat> if it's not embedded, then they hit, hit the full 7,000. So what does that look like on this plan? Because coinsurance is at 70%, that next line. What that means is that the insurance company is going to cover 70%. You are going to be responsible for 30. Um, so I'm gonna give you an example. Uh, when, you, when you talk to me, oftentimes you get hurt and you get hospitalized a couple of times in a couple of different ways, uh, but it's the easiest way to understand. January 2nd, you have a car accident and you are admitted to the hospital. So what's going to happen is, and this is an embedded plan, so that means you only have to hit that 3500 Your hospital bill is going to be 20000 What you're really going to pay is 3500 to meet your deductible, and then you're going to pay 30% of the rest of the bill. So 20000 minus 3500 is 16500 and you're only going to pay 30% of that. So that's going to be $4,950. That is going to be added to the 3,500 you started with, and you're going to be at $8,450 that you're going to be responsible for on that first hospital visit, January 2nd. Now, the very next line shows your out-of-pocket maximum, and that's very important because that out-of-pocket maximum is the most that you can spend in cash flow on approved in-network procedures for the entire year. So I just told you that you were at 8,450 bucks already on January 2nd, which means that you have $100 and that's the rest that you're going to have to pay, including co-pays for the rest of the year. That's what that out-of-pocket maximum is. So really, those are the things that you need to focus on is what is my original cost going to be and what is the maximum that I could ever have to actually pay in any given year. Uh oh, I just froze. Can you still see me? Tracy, can you still yeah, see me? Yeah, sorry, there we go. Um, I pushed the wrong button. We can see you, you are frozen, but we can hear you. Okay, perfect. As if long as you want to stop your video and restart it, I bet that will work. And while uh, we're doing that, we did have a quick question about our insurance policy state specified. Oh no, did we lose? I think we lost you. We can see your screen, but we can't hear you. Oh, Amber, are you there? Sorry for the technical difficulties, everybody. I'm sure Amber will be right back. Let's give her a second. Okay, it looks like she dropped off and she'll probably get right back on, so. Let me give her a second. In the meantime, um, does anybody have any questions? Here she is. You can go ahead and put them in the chat and I'll get them to her as soon as she gets back in. All right, here's Amber. Oh, she's muted. And I'm giving you co-hosting abilities. <laughs> So Tracy, I'm actually going to need to share this with you and have you do the slides because I'm now mobile. My oh. Zoom totally crashed. All right, no problem.
That's why we, <clears throat> that's why we have technology. So while I'm sending this over, what was the question in the chat about um, state specific? Yeah, it's just said, are insurance policies state specified? They are not only state specified, they're county specified. So uh, typically in New York, the policies will stay similar, um, but you will see little nuances change from county to county. Um, the crazy thing is, is that, uh, but when you look at those metaled plans, those basic, uh, those basic provisions that you have for gold, silver, bronze, those are national regulations. So there are different layers of what you have to look for when it comes to, um, to that side, unfortunately. I'm sorry, that's not an easier answer, but it is what it is. Uh, so as I get this up and moving, um, there's Tracy's email. Okay. Uh, copying that, and I'm going to just share this presentation with you. Ah, technology. Still, it doesn't, right? We love it. So, in those deductible uh plans those are the things that we really that i really like to focus on are where you where the insurance kicks in so how much do you have to give out of pocket before your insurance really kicks in and where the bleeding stops is typically how i refer to that when do we no longer have to uh, worry about any sort of contributions to our health care and that will help you look at the cash flow and understand exactly what is going to be required of your family. Uh, then the other part of that chart that I was looking at is just for prescriptions. Typically, those are good to know. Um, typically, there's three tiers. There's a generic tier, which is five to $15 usually. And generic is really that name that you can never pronounce that is the, um, the chemical name of it. Uh, name brands is usually that second line. And name brands are the Prilosex and things like that, that you know the name of, but for whatever reason, um, you can't go to the generic. Now, the third tier are formulary. And the ones that I always think of as formulary are those that still have the patent on them. So think the ones that have the commercials, they're still making money on them. They still can charge that higher premium because they do have the patent on them. So they're going to charge you more. And that's what that third tier usually is. Um, think EpiPen is usually that third tier, unfortunately. Uh, and those are the costs that are going to happen in any plan that you should know before you pick it. Um, <clears throat> then it's understanding the cost of the bottom part of that chart was also the cost of um, what it would be to you either on a uh, monthly or on a paycheck version. And that's how I look at that. So when you look at the silver plan, which is that middle plan versus the bronze, the big thing to note there is that there's no co-pays, which means that deductible that you're going to need to satisfy before the insurance kicks in is always there. So every time you go to the doctor for a sick visit, it's going to cost $150 or $170. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to cost, it's going to cost street value. There is a negotiated customary cost for a doctor's visit that United Healthcare or Empire has already satisfied uh, or has already negotiated. So at that point, you will pay that and you will pay that up until the point when your deductible is hit. Now, coinsurance is the amount of the cost that the insurance company is going to cover. So in that middle column, it says 70%. That means the insurance company will cover 70% and you will cover the other 30. On that bronze plan, that one on the right-hand side, the reason that it says 100 is because <clears throat> after you have satisfied the deductible, 
there are no more out of pocket costs for you. So there is a level of, that's kind of nice. If I don't go to the doctor very often, if it's really only there for a emergent situation, then you know that you're going to have to have at any point $7,000 out of pocket and then you're done for an emergent situation. Does that make sense to everyone? Is there, how to get a couple thumbs up? Is there any questions kind of about how to, to look at these? And I know it's a lot of information and I know that most of these words you only use once or twice in your life or once or twice a year. So uh, the, the point of these conversations is to go over these, these terms again and make sure that you're comfortable with them. So if there's any questions, feel free to. There is actually a question, but uh, first, um, are you able to see my screen that I'm sharing? Yes. Okay. Um, I just had gotten a comment that maybe we weren't seeing the screen. Um, the other question was, what is coinsurance? Yes, coinsurance is the portion of the insurance that the in, that the carrier, the insurance company, is responsible for once you've hit your deductible. So once you've spent that thirty five hundred, or once you've spent that seven thousand, that is how much the insurance company will be responsible for up until the point where you hit your out-of-pocket maximum. And then once you've hit your out-of-pocket max, then, you're, then the insurance company takes over all of the costs. Okay, right. awesome. Next page. Tracy, can you go to the next slide? Nice. Did it work? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So HSA. HSA is, I think, a very underutilized uh, benefit because it is not understood. HSA is a account that you can use. It must be with an IRS approved plan. So on your plan name, it's going to say silver 3000 HSA, something like that. And you're going, that is an approved plan. You And if your employer does not have an HSA account, if it's not part of your benefit plan, you can absolutely go to your own bank and open one up. And the reason that you would want to do that is because for an individual, you can put $3,650 into an account and have it be a tax deduction. This goes in before taxes. If you're a family, you can put up to 7,300 and they actually increase these levels every single year. And this money can be used for deductibles. It can be used for COBRA premiums, which I said were a little bit more expensive. Um, it can be used for Medicare expenses. Whatever medical expenses you have, you can use it for, but you don't have to. That's the thing. This is not a use it or lose it plan. It rolls over from year to year. And once you've hit a certain threshold in the account, you can actually invest this money so that it's even working for you. And this can be an additional layer to your retirement planning if you don't need to use this on a deductible this year or whatever it might be. There are actually significant tax planning and retirement opportunities that can be had in an HSA. And I'm happy to go into that in a little bit more detail, but that's the big point is that you can put money away, tax deferred, tax free. And when you pull it out, it's also tax free. You use it on medical expenses. Um, and it can be, it does not have to be used this year. It's not that FSA plan where if you don't use it by December 31st, you'll lose it. Nope. This one can stick around for forever. <coughs> Any quick questions on it? I okay, it looks like there was a question. And sure. I'm getting a warning that my internet isn't unstable, so <laughs> fingers crossed. Um, if my income is only spousal support, can I start an HSA account from my bank? You have to be enrolled in an HSA IRS approved plan. And if you are on a spousal plan, he can put, he or she 
can put in that up to 7,300 for the family into one plan. All right, um, looks like another question. How can HSA deductions be pre-taxed if opened at a bank? Uh, you actually declare them on your 1040s for the next year to get the tax deduction. So you pay for it with tax money and then you get the deduction when you file for the year. Okay. Um, and uh, My Myra, who's on the call, she's also one of our Savvy Lady volunteers. Awesome. Um, she put a key point, if you're approaching retirement, you need to stop making HSA contributions beginning six months prior. Yes. Um, and then add on taking Medicare. Yes, yes. So once you, once you start the enrollment process for the Medicare, you need to stop contributions. And now you can use your contributions that you made prior to that for Medicare expenses, uh, but you, you can no longer contrib con contribute. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Okay. So next one, retirement plans. So retirement plans come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. I am not going to go into the nitty gritty of what type of plan it is and how it works because we'd be here for another two hours. The big things to understand about retirement plans are that you get to contribute pre-tax money and it grows tax deferred. That is one of the biggest benefits of having any retirement plan is you can put in a little bit of money, you can put in a lot of money. There are absolutely limits to it, but you can put in money so that it you get the tax deduction on it today and it grows tax deferred. You can also have the opportunity in some plans to be able to take a loan out for things like a down payment on a house or medical expenses. And then it's a loan to yourself. It's actually not a loan to a bank or anything else. That interest rate that you pay for taking that loan gets deposited back into your account. Uh, so those are good things to just kind of remember uh, when working with those types of accounts. Things to know, things to ask your employer. How much does your employer match? Does it match 3%? If you put in 3%, do they put in 3%? Because if they do, do it. You're leaving money on the table if you don't just do that little portion. But if they're going to put money in, what is their vesting schedule? Which means if they, the money that they put in, not the money that you put in, the money that they put in, how long do you have to stay with the organization so that you get to keep all of that money. And there are different ways that they structure that. So make sure that you understand it. It very rarely is it simply that you, they match 3% and you always get to keep it, right? Like from day one, they want that to be a little bit of a, a sticking point. They want to be able to hold you there. And that's one of their incentives to do it. So understand what that vesting schedule is. How long, it's usually five years. Sometimes it can be shorter or longer, but over the next five years, how much of your money would you be able, or how much of their contribution money would you be able to take if you took a different opportunity with another firm? Um, also remember that all the money that goes in there cannot be accessed other than by loan without penalty before 59 and a half. So this is an awesome long-term savings opportunity, but remember that there will be some handcuffs to getting to that money if you can't take a loan. Um, sometimes people kind of forget to ask that question or, or kind of remember that that's part of this account is that 59 and a half is that magic number where you can start to access the money without a penalty from the IRS. And <clears throat> finally, that money can be taken with you. If you go from one opportunity to the next, you can roll that money from one 401k to the next 401k or from one step to the next step, whatever that might look like. You can do that so that your money stays with you and you don't have 18 open accounts. You can also have an IRA that you can have on the side that you can roll all of your money from your different uh, career paths into, into one spot. Um, but that way, just don't, don't leave your money behind where it's not attended and you have 18 accounts that are going on, consolidate those a little bit so that you have an opportunity to 
pay attention to it without it being overwhelming. Does that make any, any questions about that? No? Awesome. Like I said, that's the short and dirty version of retirement plans, but that, that kind of gives you that, the questions to ask HR. Uh, next one is dental and vision insurance. Now these are unfortunately exactly opposite of health insurance. Um, they are going to be, when you look at what the insurance carrier is going to cover, it's going to be the max amount that the insurance carrier will give you for the entire year not what you have to cover. So when it says 2000, that means that you have $2,000 for a crown and an implant and this and that and the other, not that you have to cover the first 2000 and they'll cover everything else. It's exactly the opposite, which is unfortunate. I wish that they would all write these so that they read similarly, but they don't. Um, again, as with any new plan, check with your current providers. Um, and also check with your dentist. Oftentimes they have a plan that is similarly priced that is just for their office anyway. And you don't have to pick it up through the company. You don't have to worry about that change and you know that you're covered. So check with your dentist because I've seen more and more offices have their own insurance that may make just as much as or more sense than what you're new firm is offering. Um, also, if you have kids of a certain age or you're of a certain age and might want to do orthodontics, that is a specific benefit that is spelled out on whether it is covered or not. Do not assume that orthodontics is covered. And often there will even be an age limit on the child that can get orthodontics in the plan. So those are two things. Like if you're coming up on, yep, my kid needs braces, it's time to think about, does my plan cover it? If it doesn't, can I wait to open enrollment and switch my plan to a plan that does cover it so that this is a little bit more affordable to me? And that's another thing that, you know, open enrollment's a good time to say, okay, what, what makes the most amount of sense for the next year? Um, and also understanding, especially on that dental, the difference between basic and major services. Sometimes those will vary. Sometimes people, sometimes a carrier will say that a crown is a basic. Sometimes it'll say it's a major. That's one that I see often kind of switch categories is the crown. Um, implants are typically major, but oddly oral surgery sometimes is under the basic. So again, just kind of going through those details, knowing what you might have coming up in the next year and if where it's covered is important on being able to manage your family's cash flow. Um, but also very, very unfortunately, both dental and vision insurance can have up to a 12 month waiting period for major work. So understanding whether your plan has a waiting period and for what type of work will help you make those decisions about, you know, do I go with a more rich benefit plan or not? Does that cost make sense to my family today? Um, dental insurance often trips up people because you switch the definitions of what maximum out of pocket means and there's lots of little details in there. So understanding that and not just assuming is very helpful. Now, especially in the state of New York, Pediatric dental is often covered under your major medical plan. So first, there could be a cost savings there if you don't have to pick up dental insurance for your whole family, if the pediatric is already covered under the, um, under the major medical. And also, there could be a cost difference on how, uh, how it's treated, whether it's that 80% or whether it's, you know, that co-insurance kicks in there too. So kind of taking, especially if you have children, taking a look at the difference between your major medical dental and the standalone dental insurance is helpful so that you're not overpaying, but your family is covered. Um, <clears throat> and that is one that HR often doesn't take a look at. 
All right. It looks like there is a question here. Perfect. Um, for crowns, implants, and other major expenses, should I wait for decision on pre-certification requests before getting the service? Oh, especially if you know what's coming up, it is prudent to call for pre-screening and at least understand what your cost is going to be if they, and if they need a, a pre-authorization. Yes. Um, uh, somebody's expressing their opinion that they don't mean to be Debbie Downer, but finding a decent dental insurance is really difficult. <laughs> I a thousand percent agree. This is often one of the hardest um, insurances to kind of get your head around because I only go to the dentist twice and he's going to only charge me a hundred bucks. Why would I pay 50 bucks a month when I could just pay out of pocket? There is absolutely that decision that I feel needs spreadsheeted for most families to make a prudent decision. I don't feel like dental insurance is like car insurance where you have to have it um, because sometimes just paying out of pocket makes more sense. I am not one that is yay dental insurance <laughs> at its core. If we can find a solution that fits, fantastic because I'm also a Debbie Downer about that. I'm, I'm good with that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. On to short term and long term disability. Uh, short term disability is for between one week and 90 days. Yes, short term disability can kick in as short as seven days. Sometimes I see it at 14 days, sometimes I see it at seven, but in those first two weeks. So think you get pneumonia and you can't work for three weeks or four weeks like I did a couple of years ago. I got paid for two weeks because I had short-term disability. You break your leg and you're out for six weeks. That's what these are. Uh, and you will, I, I don't believe that in this series has, you've seen the disability, but the disability definitions are typically, if you cannot do your job, then it will pay you a portion of your income, typically about 50%. Um, the short-term will look at doing it every week the long-term will probably pay you more monthly and the long-term kicks in from 90 days. And then that's where you need to understand what this looks like. Is it for two years? Is it for up until age 65? How long does that, how long will that disability pay out once I become disabled? Um, and those are things that are very plan specific. And if they don't meet your needs, you can go out into the open market and get supplemental short-term or long-term disability. And that's for another session, but know that this is going to be the place where you're going to get the best cost savings. And they're probably not going to ask you any or very few medical questions to be able to get this. Um, so being able to be part of a group plan gives you that what we call guaranteed placement of the product and, um, at a lower cost because you cost share with everyone. So that's why if they have it, absolutely look into it, understand how much it's going to pay, how long it's going to pay for, and what that definition is for you to qualify as disabled. Um, then again, this just like any other of the ones that we've talked about, it can either be paid for by you fully, by the employer fully, or it can be a cost share. And who pays for it? will determine on whether or not it's taxable. So understanding that, and if your HR doesn't have the answer, which sometimes they don't, then reach out to Savvy Ladies so that we can help you understand exactly what that looks like because understanding the taxable consequence is huge. Absolutely. Um, and that's kind of the short and dirty. You see some companies offer this, you see that some don't. Uh, and that's why it's a supplemental that can, if it's not offered in your benefit package, you can absolutely go on the open market and get it. Um, but this is where you'll find the best cost savings for it. Any questions about these? No, awesome. And then finally, we are on to life insurance and accidental death and dismemberment. Uh, so things to ask your HR about this is how much is offered? Typically it's $50,000. Um, 
This is a, uh, you can have more offered. 50,000 is usually that entry level and the employer will, will cover it fully, which is fantastic. Now, should that be your full pl planning for life insurance? Probably not, but it's a great place to start. Um, also, can family members participate? That's often overlooked. Can my family member be covered without having any medical questions, which is exactly what this usually is, and at a significant cost savings from what you could find on the individual market? These are typically pennies. Look into this. This is a fantastic benefit for your family. God forbid something happens. Um, and if you, if they do offer a fuller life insurance plan, say a couple hundred thousand or up to a million or something like that, are there medical questions that are asked? You know, what does that process look like? Um, understanding that from your HR will be imperative to whether or not that makes sense for your family or not. Uh, life insurance typically cannot be taken from one firm to another. So don't depend on this if you ever expect a transition on a job, right? You usually cannot take this with you. And if you can take it with you, the cost is typically exorbitant. So keep that in mind uh, when, you're, when you're looking at this. And um, accidental death and dismemberment, uh, the accidental death part is kind of self-explanatory, uh, but the dismemberment is you need to lose one hand or one foot or one of each. And that is what they consider dismemberment. Um, so you only have to lose, only have to lose uh, one partial appendage to be considered for that. Um, but understanding that definition is also good. And these are nitty gritty, right? There's details that you don't wanna have to overlook, but the great part of it is, is that life insurance, short-term and long-term disability can all be re-elected into an open enrollment. So you say, oh, I missed the boat the first time because I was overwhelmed filling out a million pages for my new job. And I really just needed to get health insurance in there and understand what my new cash flow was with my new salary, right? You can add these in the next year during open enrollment time. So don't ever just kind of slough that off as, ah, I'm good with what I have. Take a look, see if they're offering anything now. See if they're, you know, what's changed, what's, what's available that you can pick from. Uh, because this being able to participate in group plans is always going to be your best cost opportunity. Maybe not your be biggest benefit, but your best cost for basic benefit opportunity that's out there. All right, and that's the end for me. Any more questions? I <coughs> Excuse me. Um uh, looks like that Anna just wrote in the chat. Thank you very much for this. Um, she'd been in HR for 18 years and takes great pride in being very knowledgeable for her team members, but agrees that in HR in general needs to do a better job on this. Um, I know they're not, you know, HR people are not the insurance experts. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's reasonable to have them say, let me check with my broker. Let me, you know, let me do something like that. But asking the question and them brushing off the question is the, is the frustrating part on the broker side, on my side, right? Like I'm here to answer those questions. Um, and if you don't get a sufficient question, gather all the documents and bring them to us. Um, you know, the, bring them to us. Somebody will be able to answer the question and, and we'll get to the bottom of it. Absolutely. They're not the insurance experts. They have a whole lot more going on. I can't answer anything about payroll and they have to do all of that. <laughs> so they have a bigger job to juggle. Um, theirs is more about the implementation side. So being patient with them and helping walk through the process is, is important. Absolutely. Wonderful. Um, getting more thank yous. Barbara says, thank you for informative, clear and concise presentation. Um, I think it, I think it laid everything out. I know that I learned a lot, um, always confused with the HSA, um, FSA, uh, of which am I eligible for? I think that was a great piece. I appreciate, um, learning more so, about that. So my trick to remember which one is which is the FSA. You have to use fast. F 
best. And that one you have to use within the year. HSA is the one that rolls over. So that's my little acronym to remember. F is fast. I have to use FF. I have to use my FSA um, as the little, my little trick. <clears throat> yes, you can have both an FSA and an HSA. Uh, some, uh, the FSA is more of a benefit that's actually provided by the employer. The HSA is something that you, you contribute, contribute to. An employer can contribute to the HSA, uh, but they're more likely to um, contribute to FSA because of the things that you can use that money for. Right. Uh, yeah. Oh. Looks like we had another thank you. Um, wish I had done something like this before they started their new job. Deciphering 20 options of health insurance. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> um, all right. Well, if there are no more questions, thank you all. I want to give a big thank you to Amber because this was really a wonderful presentation. And I think we have learned a lot. Amber has put her contact information in the chat. Um, I'm always happy to answer a question. So shoot me over an email anytime. Wonderful. Thank you. And the recording will be available as soon as we uh, get it edited and it will be available on our website. Um, so I will uh, go ahead and stop sharing. Um, again, if you have any questions, reach out to Amber, try our helpline. Let me see if I can go ahead and put our helpline back. There is our helpline. Um, thank you for spending your afternoon with us and take care.